debunking four energy myths in 15 minutes or less. First, following on Mark's point, the first myth, natural gas is a bridge fuel. You've heard this over and over. Well, in the meantime, until we find something else, a new renewable fuel, new unobtainium fueled future, we will use natural gas as a bridge fuel. The reality is that natural gas is the fuel that we've been looking for. It is clean, it is abundant, it is relatively cheap, it can be produced in great quantities domestically, and it is extremely flexible. But how big is this resource? Well, it is enormous. If you look at the Potential Gas Committee's report from last June, they placed potential U.S. gas resources, and I think it was 1,700 trillion cubic feet. What does that mean? On an oil equivalent basis, that's over 350 billion barrels. That's greater than the proved reserves of Venezuela and Saudi Arabia combined. This is an enormous resource. Resources aren't reserves, but this issue now, we are still trying to get a hold of it. But the fact is, we have an abundance of natural gas, and that leads to a real problem, particularly when it comes to Washington. So here's my thinking on this, that Dick Cheney, given what we're hearing, about, particularly out of the White House, Dick Cheney is going to have to waterboard Barack Obama before we ever hear the president utter the words, natural gas. <laughs> My second myth, energy transitions can happen quickly. And I'm gonna depart from some of my colleagues here on the podium this morning, um, particularly when it regards to transportation. Um, they're talking about natural gas displacing diesel fuel and up to four million barrels a day of diesel. We have just completed in the last few years a transition from high sulfur motor fuel and diesel market to ultra low sulfur diesel. <coughs> many billions of dollars, tens of billions of dollars were spent by refiners and by <coughs> truck manufacturers and engine makers to accommodate that switch. We now have some of the cleanest diesel fuel in the world, 50, less than 15 parts per million. And now we're going to force another change in the heavy truck market so that we can place diesel when refineries are being built in Saudi Arabia and India that will supply diesel on a global market? Why? My third myth or rather the common, it's not my myth, it is the common myth, wind energy cuts, uh, makes substantial cuts in CO2 emissions. The reality is this. If wind energy, if wind generated energy cuts CO2 emissions, and it's a big if, I've seen several studies that in fact show the opposite, that increased use of wind increases CO2 emissions. But if wind energy decreases CO2 emissions, the reductions in those emissions will be so small as to be insignificant. The data on this is clear. Despite the hype that we're hearing from the wind energy, particularly from the American Wind Energy Association, um, the facts are clear. Look at Denmark. This is the country that is the poster child for renewable energy boosters around the world. Um, Thomas Friedman, New York Times columnist, He's won three Pulitzers, I've won none, so <laughs> take, it, take it for what it's worth. He wrote a while back, if only we could be like Denmark. Last April, Barack Obama, in an Earth Day speech, said we should be more like Denmark. They're leading the world in renewable energy consumption. Fine. What are the numbers? Between 1999 and 2007, Denmark more than doubled the amount of wind-generated electricity that it produces going from under about 3 billion kilowatt hours to over 7 billion kilowatt hours. In 2007, Denmark's coal consumption was at exactly the same level as it was in 1999. And in fact, in 1999, the coal consumption in Denmark was about the same as it was in 2001. But between 2001 and, I'm sorry, between 1981 and 2007, Denmark's natural gas consumption went from zero to 400 million cubic feet per day. Denmark's own grid operator, EnergyNet.dk, makes no claim that wind-generated electricity reduces CO2 emissions. And if you look at their own data, 
Their own data shows there has been no reduction in their CO2 emissions from the electricity generation sector, despite this enormous build-out of wind-generated electricity. Further, Denmark uses uh, hydropower as the backup for their wind-generated electricity. They have a zero-carbon backup. Here in the U.S., we'll have to use natural gas, or we'll have to cycle coal plants. Um, they have a zero-carbon backup for their wind, and they still, um, when you look at IEA numbers, Denmark's natural CO2 emissions in 2007 have declined by one-tenth of one percent when compared to 1990 levels. This myth that wind energy reduces CO2 emissions is just that. My final myth. Renewable energy sources, excuse me, are on the cusp of viability. The reality is, unless we come up with some, uh, and this is not a new problem, ultra-large, ultra-cheap uh, storage methods for energy, renewable energy sources will remain bid players in the global energy mix. The problem is that their low power density makes them unviable. And power density is the key issue. I discuss power density at length in my new book. It'll be out April 27th. It's called Power Hungry. You don't have to read it. You just have to buy it. <laughs> Van Jones. You know, you've heard of Van Jones. He was the, the uh, Obama administration's uh, green jobs advisor. He had a piece in The Economist earlier this month, and he wrote this. He said, public policies are now necessary to correct existing market failures and put clean energy on an even playing field with fossil fuels. Having an even playing field between renewables and fossil fuels will require repealing the laws of physics. That's not going to happen. Let me focus on the issue of power density because this is a key issue. And it's one of the, if you were asked me to brag about one fact in my book, it's this. Power density is key, particularly when you compare wind energy and hydrocarbons. Wind turbines generate about one watt per square meter. That's the measure of power density. Or you can, you can use uh, horsepower per acre if you prefer. It's about 1.2 watts per square meter for wind turbines. Even a marginal natural gas well. Definition of a stripper well, 60,000 cubic feet per day. A, a marginal gas well producing 60,000 cubic feet per day has a power density 23 times greater than that of a wind turbine. Even a marginal oil well producing just two barrels a day has a power density of 5.5 watts per square meter, which is four times as great as that from a wind turbine. My summary is clear. The fuels of the future, the thesis of my book, the fuels of the future can be described as end to end, natural gas to nuclear. I take Mark's point about the high cost of nuclear. I'm bullish on the prospects for modular reactors, reactors of 125 megawatts or less. Uh, Babcock and Wilcox, a division of McDermott, Houston-based company, is now working on commercialization of a 125 megawatt reactor. If you can fuel that with thorium rather than uranium, it's a breakthrough technology, a true breakthrough technology. Yes, it'll be expensive, but I think they can, they're claiming they can manufacture them for $5,000 a kilowatt, and they can manufacture them. They can have a central factory and then ship them to the final location. My point regarding nuclear power is this. If you are anti-carbon and you are anti-nuclear, you are pro-blackout. <laughs> In summary, hydrocarbons are here to stay. Natural gas is not a bridge fuel. It is a fuel of the future. Um, and the fuels of the future are end to end. Thank you.